All right, so uh, I yeah. promised myself I wouldn't say any marine jokes. And then I see my brother, my brother decided to join us today. He made it. And he just got out of the Marine Corps, so here goes. There's this Air Force pilot, and he's sitting at a bar drinking a beer. And he turns to the guy next to him and he says, Hey, buddy, you want to hear a Marine joke? And the guy says, sure, but before you tell that joke, you should know that I'm a Marine. And the guy sitting next to me, he's 200 pounds, six foot two, and he's a Marine. And the guy sitting next to him, he's six foot five, 250 pounds, and he's a Marine. Now, you still want to tell that joke? And the Air Force pilot says, nah, don't want to have to explain it three times. <laughs> I need some body armor for when I go out into the parking lot <clears throat> later. All right, my name is Wes O'Donnell. I'm managing editor of InMilitary.com and InCyberDefense.com, two websites that are owned by American Military University. So the story is I had built myself a military blog called WarriorLodge.com. It did okay, it got on the radar of AMU, and they said, hey, we want you to come build us a version of warriorlodge.com that we can use at the university in content marketing. So I built them in military.com and in cyberdefense.com, and I'm also the managing editor. They kept me on board there. And I'm also the president of Pure West Media. Uh, it is uh, the state of Michigan's largest business directory and it's also the premier lifestyle magazine for West Michigan. So I'm a veteran of both the US Army and the US Air Force for a total of 10 years active duty. And it's not too common with audiences like this, but civilians will ask me all the time. They'll say, wait, you did two branches? And I'll say, yeah. So I was in the infantry. I was in 2nd Battalion, 327th Infantry, 101st Airborne Division. And we were walking through the desert in Kuwait with 200 pounds of weight on our back. And I strolled into this air base called Ali Asalim. And the Air Force was living there. And the Air Force was in air-conditioned tents. And that blew my mind. My, my primitive infantry brain couldn't understand how somebody would go to the extent for comfort of hooking up an air conditioning unit to a tent. And so I said, boys, when my contract's up, I'm going to the Air Force. And they're like, nah, O'Donnell, you're BS, and you're not going to the Air Force. And sure enough, I had a break in service, a very short break in service, and I joined the Air Force. Come to find out, air-conditioned tents, that's actually roughing it for the Air Force. Normally, they're in a five-star hotel somewhere. I'm not joking. Well, let me tell you the ultimate reason why the Air Force is smarter than the Army in my experience in both branches. And that is in the Army, the officers send the enlisted out to fight. Private, take that hill. Sir, yes, sir. In the Air Force, it's the enlisted that send the officers out to fight. Have a nice flight, sir. Smarter, smarter. All right, thanks for joining this session. Uh, and it really does warm my heart to see so many veteran entrepreneurs, so many mill spouse entrepreneurs, so much active duty in one place. It's my belief that uh, because of their uh, relationship with the military, veterans are going to be responsible for one of the largest economic booms in US history. Why? Veterans have the stomach to take risks. They have the ability to deal with ambiguity. They have composure and creativity under extreme pressure. And they have an unparalleled focus on team as a way to win a fight. And the branch doesn't matter. These traits, these skills, transcend service branch. Although me personally, I'll never get tired of bagging on the Marine Corps. So I just gave an interview at All Marine Radio for one of the articles that we're going to talk about today. Uh, and they said, uh, you're the first Air Force guy we've ever had on the show. Is it true what they say about the Air Force? Is it is actually a better... Uh, better standard of living. I'm like, oh yeah. Yeah, believe the hype. It is absolutely true. 
All right, so I'm here to talk to you today about viral articles. Now, no one can really agree on a benchmark for what makes an article or a video go viral. So I teach predictive analytics at Baker College in Michigan, and just for our purposes today, I've created our own metric for viral. So we're gonna call it being read and shared over 100,000 times by unique individuals in a 24-hour period. Now, I've been fortunate enough to have written four articles that have gone viral in the past three years, um, mostly on Facebook. And it occurs to me that each of these articles has several common elements uh, associated with each one, that if we can zero in on what those elements are, then perhaps we can increase the rate at which the rest of our articles are read and shared. So the first article is called A French Soldier's View of U.S. Soldiers in Afghanistan. Three years ago, I was trying to get an article idea, and I was playing around on Reddit, and I stumbled into the French area of Reddit, and I saw an article entirely in French that was entitled, uh, A No Ferri de Armi Americanes. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. It was written by a French newspaper, but the title itself was also in English, and it was a French soldier's view of US soldiers. It piqued my interest. So I took the article, I copied it, I translated it, I broke it into sections, I added my own commentary, and then I posted it to Warrior Lodge. This article was shared over a million times in the first 24 hours. Celebrities started to get in on it. Uh, Bill Crystal from Fox News, or he was at Fox News at the time, made statements about it. I reposted it two and a half years later to end military, and then it went viral again, as if it were new, with another 200,000 shares in 24 hours. This one article, years later, still earns enough ad revenue from Google AdSense uh, to pay my mortgage. It's insane, the, the value of this French article. And we're gonna see some of the elements that go into this article here in a few minutes. So what's interesting about this article is that it is positively gushing with praise from a French soldier to an American soldier. I mean, it is over the top positive. So much so that some people believe that there's no way it could have been written by a Frenchman, that it has to be American propaganda does it matter? I think it stoked in the comments section a lot of the debate about whether it was real or not, or whether it was written by an American or written by a Frenchman, uh, that continued its engagement, that continued its propagation through social media. All right, the second article that we're gonna look at, veteran suicide and the false narrative of the number 22. There is one number that defines the way many Americans think about modern military veterans. And that number is 22. As in, 22 veterans commit suicide daily in the United States. Now this number has been blasted out across mainstream media as a call to action for the advocates of the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. Let me repeat that. It's been blasted out on mainstream media as a call to action for the advocates of the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. The problem with the number 22 is that it's based on a false narrative. It's based on bad data. First, this number is based on a Veterans Affairs report from 2012 using numbers reported from only 21 states from 1999 through 2011. This represents only 40% of the U.S. population and massive states, states with huge veteran communities like California and Texas, don't report suicides to the VA. As you can deduce, we should be using the number 22 as a bare minimum or a starting point. 
But more alarming, the entire generation of veterans that have been implicated in the number 22, that is, post 9-11 veterans, are not, according to the data, the generation that is committing suicide. In reality, only one modern veteran takes his or her own life daily. Now, that's still one too many. But where do the rest of the numbers come from? By the data, the vast majority of veteran suicides are Vietnam-era veterans. So when the media reports falsely on this, two things happen. First, Vietnam veterans are not getting the support and the outreach and the treatment that they clearly need. And second, having such a big, inaccurate number attached to the younger generation of veterans perpetuates a destructive stereotype. And that is, younger veterans are somehow broken and unable to compete for meaningful employment in the civilian world. False. Well, this article that got posted didn't do as well as the French article, but it was still shared across social media 150,000 times in 24 hours. The third article, why saying thank you for your service offends some veterans. This one's close to my heart. The premise of this article is simple. Some veterans feel uneasy when you say thank you for your service. Why? Well, most of us don't feel like we did anything special. They even paid me to be there. Cash money, US American, twice a month. Paid for my education. I'm debt free. I have no student loan debt. It's worth mentioning that I actually took my name off of this article because of the volume of death threats that I received. Really, really, really touched a nerve. I'll tell you this, civilians do not want to be told to not say thank you to your service to veterans. I didn't realize how, how serious it was until they started saying, you know, we're going to we know where your mom lives. We're going to go stab her in the ears with a pencil and just crazy, crazy uh, stuff. Not civil at all. All right. So there are five traits, five traits that all three articles have in common. And there's a fourth article that didn't make the cut before I assembled this presentation that we'll talk about a little bit. Number one, Authenticity. We live in a phony world. We have fake news, fake profiles on social media. When we get an email that's the subject line is in all caps and it says, try this now with a bunch of exclamation points, we know it's fake. We know it's spam. Humans today have a very sophisticated BS filter. And when companies or articles approach us today with a bunch of hype, we immediately tune it out and we discard it. So that brings up the question, what does work? So traveling around the country and speaking to veterans groups about entrepreneurship, speaking to companies about why they need to hire veterans, uh, standing on stage and, and connecting with these audiences of three or, or 500 or 1,000 people, one thing I've discovered is that this is a cross-section of American society. And one thing I've discovered is that these people crave authenticity. They crave originality, vulnerability. There's not enough real right now in the world. Something written with an authentic voice. And it's fascinating how phony we are as people. We could get on an elevator, see somebody that we've never met before, and want to talk to them. And the first thing we think of is, man, i got to think of something to say to this person. How cool would it be? What would happen if, in that moment, you turned directly to that person and you said, I'm trying to think of something to say to you right now? I mean, how cool would that, how, how vulnerable, how authentic would that be? There is a fourth article that I mentioned, and it's called The Real Reason the U.S. Navy Keeps Hitting Merchant Vessels. It went viral as well, 
Um, it did about the level of the 22 article, about 150,000, between 150 and 200,000 views in 24 hours. Uh, what's interesting about this article, the real reason the US Navy keeps hitting merchants is that I secured an interview with a retired US Navy captain. And he requested to remain anonymous. And he was very clear about the reason a US Navy warship would get run down by a merchant vessel. It's also the same reason why the US Air Force is losing thousands of pilots to the civilian world. At least in his mind, he made it clear that when you use the military as a social change agent and not a fighting force, this is the, these are the types of problems that you get. He was very clear that a lot of these sailors had completed their, let's say, transgender sensitivity training, but they hadn't completed very basic skills training for their rating to be able to effectively do their job. This article is absolutely dripping with authenticity. Authenticity is one of the most valuable things that you can bring when you're either creating video or when you're writing an article. All these articles, these four that we're talking about, are speaking with an authentic voice. Audi can spend $2.5 million on a commercial for YouTube, and it barely gets any engagement. But it's the video of dad getting kicked in the junk, shot on an iPhone, that goes viral. Why? Because it's authentic. All right, all three, four, in the case of the Navy article, go against preconceived notions of reality or they challenge stereotypes. For the French soldier's view of US soldiers in Afghanistan, during the presidency of George W. Bush, uh, when we were preparing to invade Iraq, uh, the French didn't want to go. You guys remember this. Uh, our response was to rename French fries Freedom Fries. Uh, there was a bunch of hate being thrown at the country of France. This is still in our collective memory as a society. So an article entitled A French Soldier's View of US Soldiers in Afghanistan sets the reader up for something completely different than what they get. It's different than clickbait, but it sets up an expectation that then gets shattered, a preconceived notion that gets challenged. The number 22. Not the article, but the actual number 22 spread like wildfire across social media for the past two years. Dozens of nonprofits have sprung up with the number 22 in its name. And the article, the false narrative of the number 22, tells the reader why that number is wrong from a quantity perspective and the generation of veterans that it represents. And the thank you for your service article for obvious reasons uh, shatters preconceived civilian notions of reality. Um, just out of curiosity, if any veterans that we have in the room right now, does anybody feel remotely uneasy when somebody approaches you and says, thank you for your service? I mean, that's about half. There is a US Marine turned photographer, Joel Pariez, and he's created a photo series that's gone viral, and it's worth looking into this photo series one of the main reasons that this photo series went viral is that it challenges our preconceived notions and a lot of our stereotypes that media and society in general forces into our brain through repetition. So whether it's a Harvard graduate, a New York City nurse, a missionary, or the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. People like their stereotypes challenged. They like their preconceived notions of reality challenged. I produce and host a video show that is OK. It's moderately successful, um, called Heroes from History. Uh, these episodes have a couple thousand views each. Nothing to write home about. But there was one article in particular 
uh, one video in particular, uh, that was based on a black U.S. Army soldier named Milton Olive III, who in 1965 was on patrol with his squad in Vietnam. They made contact with the enemy, the Viet Cong. Uh, the Viet Cong turned and fled, and one of the enemy turned and lobbed a grenade back towards Olive's squad. Private Olive nonchalantly raised his hand and said, I got it, grabbed the grenade, tucked it into his chest, and laid down on it. PFC Olive was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor and was the first African-American Medal of Honor recipient of the Vietnam War. And in jumping on that grenade, he saved the lives of his squad, both black men and white men. And in doing so, taught us all how we ought to live. Now, America has been called a melting pot because of all the ethnicities and nationalities that go into making this great nation. But I don't like melting pot. Melting pot sort of implies that everything becomes the same color and consistency, sort of like a homogenous goo. So I like to think of America as a pizza, where every ingredient is unique and distinct, but contributes to a delicious whole. Make no mistake, America is powerful uh, because of our diversity, and you wouldn't know it. Uh, the, the, the Heroes video, this video in particular, resounded with people who were told that race relations in America are at an all-time low. And it showed that, at least from the military perspective, that there is hope. Number three, patriotism confirmation. All four of these articles confirm the reader's deeply held convictions about military service and patriotism. The French article makes people feel proud, whether it's real or not. The 22 article gets people fired up to learn more and do more to help prevent veteran suicide. And the thank you for your service article, whether you agree or disagree, gets people emotionally charged with patriotic fervor. And going along with number three, going along with, pa with patriotism confirmation, would be knowing your audience. So let's call it 3.5. Saying that writing a patriotic article and expecting it to go viral and serving it up to people who kneel for the national anthem, obviously it's not going to work. Now I suspect that everybody in this room has a very good idea of who your ideal audience is. But it's always a good exercise to record that demographic information from Google Analytics, from Facebook Insights, and keep that in the back of your mind as you write and as you create. All right, number four. Hit you right in the feels. Everybody remember this photo? Sergeant Major Brad Casal, Fallujah, 2004, shot seven times at close range with an AK-47. More than 40 shrapnel wounds, lost 60% of his blood, and still comes out ready to fight. It almost makes me take back everything I ever said about Marines. This photo made me feel, it made me feel happy, sad, proud, simultaneously. Remember this, when we care, we share. I call this targeting high arousal emotions. All these articles that we're talking about make you feel either really good or really bad, depending on your personal world, world view. Now the state of modern media has caused overstimulation in American society. People are just numb to most experiences online. I'm not saying that you need to prey on people's emotions by any stretch of the imagination. But if you can write something that genuinely pulls at people's heartstrings, that hits those high arousal emotions, you've got a winner. You can stand out by giving people an emotional experience. It's the absolute best way. 
to cut through the noise. Let me ask you something. Why do Facebook posts of stolen valor almost always go viral? Anger. Anger and a little bit of comedy. Just for the record, I feel differently about stolen valor and embellishment than most people. I feel pity. Um, I just don't, uh, I, in many cases, a lot of these people have psychological disorders. Daddy didn't give them enough attention when they were growing up and they need that validation. Um, but it's definitely uh, a lesson learned from something going viral, tapping into that anger of somebody wearing a uniform that they didn't earn or wearing medals and achievements that they didn't earn. All right, and number five, influencer shares. This is essentially why we're here, to learn new things, to network with influencers. Just like with the French article and Bill Crystal, having someone who themselves has a large quantity of followers, uh, getting them to share your work can help tremendously. Be able to build that network list and find those key individuals who can further your cause. I like to equate mentors and influencers. I'm always looking for that influencer who can also be a mentor. And we're sort of born into this, uh, at least in entrepreneurship, we're, we're born into this maze where uh, we don't know really the path to get to the finish line. Or we don't know the path to get to that point of success deep within the maze. And there's dead ends, you're gonna hit a wall and you're gonna have to turn around and go back the other direction. There's pitfalls that can kill you. And to be able to find that mentor influencer who's already been to success and can come back to you and say, this is the path to go, don't go that way, that's a dead end. Don't go that way, that's a dead end. And, and take you to success, that's huge. Find those key individuals that can further your cause, especially mentors. And then brainstorm things that uh, you can do for them because when the time comes, you're gonna wanna offer them some value in return. All right, that's what I have. I wanna thank everybody for joining us. I'm gonna open it up to questions right now. A lot more uh, content uh, offline, so I would be happy to give out my email and come and take a look at everyone's sites and does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. You know, initially, um, when we started seeing the shift from desktop to mobile, we did see a dip. We definitely saw a dip, um, and then AdSense and Google uh, got smart about it. And the way they started serving up AdSense ads from a responsive mobile perspective uh, negated any drop in revenue. Um, so maybe it was like a six-month drop that had everybody really nervous, and uh, it passed. Um, on, like, let's say, warriorlodge.com, if you were to look on your mobile right now at warriorlodge.com, you'd see, you should see an AdSense ad that floats at the bottom all the time. And the beauty of that ad is that when people are using their thumb to scroll through, um, uh, there's a possibility that Google re will, will record it as an invalid click and not give you money for it, but in most cases, uh, it does just as well as, a, let's say, a, a skyscraper ad or a banner ad on a desktop site. So, mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So, uh, off of information, I'm a content creator, uh, not a blogger, not a writer. Um, what I'm, I place a lot of value in what I do, and I love seeing all the products and references um, that go along with it. And right now, with the emphasis that we have in the space, you know, a lot of people say, like, oh, you know, nothing works until you get your credit, you know, especially in the land of brand credit. So, I want to know how do you approach a collaborative relationship? You know, what value do you place on? So that's, that's 
actually a, a very timely question for me because there's a, a man named Joe Ramirez in Los Angeles that is starting a streaming service for veterans, and he's calling it VetStream TV. And he's trying to mimic the Netflix model, and that is to have an ad-free experience where you pay a monthly subscription, uh, or you can access the content for free, but you're going to see ads all over the place. So he approached me, and he said, hey, I love warriorlogic.com. You have a whole ton of Facebook followers. What is a relationship? What does a strategic partnership look like? How can I put Betstream TV front and center on warriorlogic.com? Um, so I'm going through that same thing right now. I'm trying to see, is it, does it look like revenue sharing? Is, does he want to license warriorlogic.com's name, uh, content, and followers? Does he want to buy the whole site outright? Um, What's interesting is that when American Military University approached me to build InMilitary.com and, and manage it and start providing original content, on my own, they didn't ask me to do this, but on my own, I stopped producing original content for Warrior Lodge. Um, what exists now at Warrior Lodge is just static content. It's encyclopedic. So you could go there, you could get military pay charts, you could find the location of the closest recruiter, but there's no new original content daily going to Warrior Lodge. And I just didn't want there to be any conflict of interest uh, between Warrior Lodge and the university. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question, and I don't really have, because I'm going through it right now myself, I don't have an answer for the, what a strategic partnership in that space would look like. So. Yes, ma'am. You know, uh, Twitter is definitely number two. Um, Pinterest is picking up. Uh, but I should mention that I've never come anywhere close, close to the success on any other platform than what I've experienced on Facebook. If Facebook were to go away, I'd be done for. I mean, and I, I hate that. I hate that my business is reliant on somebody else's business, right? So if Mark Zuckerberg decides to pack it up one day, um, it's going to be painful. So, questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, I felt really strongly about something, and I wrote a couple of articles for our blog. But the blog, nobody, nobody went there. It, no one looked at it. So what I would do is I would pull it out and put it on our little Facebook page. Mm -hmm. But again, th it was, um, there are not a lot of people that go there either compared to other numbers. We're getting there, but we've yeah. got a long way to go. What would your recommendation be if you think that there are, there are a couple of posts that I think are really good should I try to uh, reintroduce them? Do you put a different spin on it? How do you, if you've done something in the past that you think now with the knowledge that you have, you could really do something with, what would your be your advice? Yeah, so in, in your case in particular, if you have content that you stand behind and you know this is good content, you just don't personally have the social reach yet, um, definitely reach out to other similar Facebook pages. And it may seem counterintuitive because we're very competitive by nature. But you know, I've gone to Seal of Honor and I've gone to some of these Facebook pages. So Warrior Lodge has somewhere, I think, 60, 60 or 70,000 Facebook followers. But that's nowhere near what some of these other very large military Facebook business pages have. And I remember going through with a list of all of these military-related Facebook pages. And I have that list. Uh, it's it's got thousands of Facebook business pages on it, and I'll gladly email it to anybody here. Uh, I went down that entire list, and 80% ignored me completely when I sent them a message. But there was a few that republished that, that resulted in this flood of traffic over to the website. And once I get them off Facebook and over to the website, that's when the money goes into the bank account. So, mm -hmm. Any, Yes, ma'am. How do you navigate um, controversial topics? You mentioned that article about thanking veterans for their service and how it brought a lot of controversy. Right. 
how do you navigate that? Is that something that you thrive on in order to be original? Do you shy away from it? Do you have any sort of strategy for those controversial topics? You know, I, I, I didn't set out to be uh, controversial with that thank you for your service article. Um, maybe I'm just oblivious to the fact that, you know, I, I just didn't expect the, the hatred, the pure, unadulterated hatred that came my way from civilians, from civilians saying, how dare you? We didn't give the Vietnam generation, you know, we, we, we treated them poorly and now we're going to really make sure that the current generation of veterans knows how much we care about them. And just the idea that some veterans roll their eyes when you say thank you for your service infuriated thousands and thousands of people. So I wouldn't shy away from a topic that may make people feel uncomfortable. And in fact, I think that's more authentic. So sticking with our authenticity theme, um, if it's something that you're passionate about, let that passion come through in the content that you create. Um, definitely don't suppress it. Uh, and in my case, I sort of pivoted when the hate started coming in and I changed my name real quick and uh, I stopped getting Facebook messages like the next day. Um, but people were calling American Military University. Somehow they, they found out that the site, because the site, it's kind of hard to tell that in military is owned by AMU. It's not blatantly obvious. Uh, but the university was getting calls in Washington, D.C. saying they're going to go kill Wes O'Donnell. And I'm like, oh, man. And I've really upset some people. So don't shy away from it, definitely. Uh, yes, sir? How am I monetizing? So, yeah, so AdSense is the primary, primary I use. Um, I should note that with purewestmichigan.com, which is the very beginning I mentioned, uh, the largest business directory in Michigan and premier travel magazine. So um, Google AdSense scares me as well because there are so many rules and regulations that if you run afoul of, Google will suspend you uh, in, in a snap. And that just frightens me if I'm using this money to support my family. So I found a better way. And that better way is to build a directory site on WordPress. Uh, in my case, West Michigan, Grand Rapids, and West towards the lakeshore, uh, list every single business, uh, and then charge them to have a more robust directory listing than just the basic listing on purewestmichigan.com and then have that recurring monthly. So thousands and thousands of businesses paying me recurring monthly to be on inside this directory. Why would they do that? Because it's also a lifestyle online magazine that I hope to be an actual published magazine sometime in late 2018. Everybody's like, print is dead. Don't go that way, but I'm going that way. Um, so I'm connecting those people that are coming to read the lifestyle magazine with these businesses that want to get in front of those customers. That's why they're paying me monthly. So that's the new uh, revenue model that I'm using, and it's all, uh, it, it doesn't really use AdSense. It doesn't use anything other than PayPal and Stripe. So. Other questions? Other questions? Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Wes. It's been wonderful to have you. Let's show them our appreciation. Thank you, guys. Thank you.